In this section, we will have an introduction into some of the most common types of post-translational modifications that are used to regulate enzyme activity. Note that there are many different types of modifications that can happen to proteins. Thus, this is a very complicated topic and we will only have a limited introduction here, which I'm sure will seem quite complicated nonetheless. Within the body, it's very important for cells to be able to quickly fine tune the regulation of enzymes or protein activity to help relay messages and provide necessary chemical components in a quick and timely manner. Thus, it's important that proteins can be regulated after they have been made. For example, if you're suffering a DNA damaging event, it's good to have repair enzymes in place and ready to go and not have to wait four hours to increase their transcription and translation. This is where post-translational protein modifications play an important role. The major modifications that we will become familiar with include disulfide bond formation, which you've already seen, or the addition of small chemical groups such as phosphorylation, hydroxylation, methylation, and acylation. The addition of larger groups can also include the addition of lipids through lipidation, the addition of sugars through glycosylation, or the attachment of small proteins through the process of ubiquitination and sumoylation. Let's start with a look at the smaller chemical modifications. Here is a closer look at the four major types of small molecule changes that you will need to be familiar with. You have phosphorylation, which is most commonly studied, followed by methylation, hydroxylation, and acylation. Note that acetylation is the simplest and most common acyl group that is added. Let's take a look at phosphorylation in a little more detail. Separate enzymes are used to mediate the phosphorylation and the dephosphorylation of a protein molecule. Enzymes that use ATP as a phosphate donor to phosphorylate their protein targets are called kinase enzymes. A separate enzyme is required to mediate the removal of a phosphate group. These enzymes are called phosphatase enzymes. Phosphorylation is a common mechanism for the activation and or inhibition of cell signaling molecules. Signaling pathways can be highly dependent on phosphorylation cascades with the activation or inhibition of multiple proteins using phosphorylation as a modifier. The kinase enzymes that mediate phosphorylation typically fall into two major classes based on their substrate target. Serine threonine protein kinases will phosphorylate specific serines or threonines within their target, whereas tyrosine kinases preferentially phosphorylate tyrosine residues within their targets. Note that not all serines or threonines will be phosphorylated by a single kinase enzyme. Kinases have high specificity for their target molecule and more specifically for a small subset of residues on their target molecule. Phosphatase enzymes, on the other hand, show less substrate specificity than kinases do, suggesting that dephosphorylation returns the cell to a baseline and is always turned on to some extent whereas kinases become active for short bursts of time to mediate their effect within the system. This is not always true, but it's commonly true. Let's take a look at acylation with a focus on acetylation. One example where protein acetylation plays an important role is the acetylation of histone proteins. Recall that histones form the core structure that's used to create the nucleosome in the formation of the chromosome structure. The nucleosome, however, needs to be released for gene transcription to occur. This is facilitated by the acetylation of the histones, which disrupts the DNA binding with the histone core. Lysine often serves as the location for acetylation. The cofactor, coenzyme A, that's holding the acetyl group often serves as the source of the acetyl group and acid base catalysis using a glutamate residue from the enzyme helps to activate the amine functional group of the lysine. Lysine can then act as a nucleophile and attack the carbonyl carbon 
forming an oxyanion intermediate. The coenzyme A then serves as the leaving group. With the histones, histone acetyltransferase proteins, or HATs, are involved in the acetylation of the histones, opening them up so the gene transcription can occur. Whereas histone deacetylases, or HDACs, remove the acetyl groups and restore the nucleosome structure. Another small molecule modification is oxidation, which commonly occurs as hydroxylation and will be the focus of our talks here. Hydroxylation occurs most often on proline or lysine residues, as we've already seen with important proteins such as collagen. Hydroxyproline makes up about 13.5% of the residues within the mammalian collagen family of proteins. Recall that collagen is the main protein of the connective tissue and represents about one-fourth of the total protein content in many animals. Hydroxyproline contributes to the stability of the triple helix and also aids in cross-linking between collagen fibers to form larger macromolecular complexes. And the last of the small chemical modifications that we will consider here is methylation. S-adenosyl methionine, or SAM, is a common methyl donor used for methylation reactions. The structure of SAM is a combination of the amino acid methionine with the ribonucleoside adenosine. Hopefully the structure is looking familiar to you. This is one example of common building blocks within the cell being used in alternate ways. This is a common feature for many macromolecule building blocks. Lysine and arginine are amino acids that are commonly modified by methylation. And you can see that they can be modified with a single methyl group or with multiple methyl groups. Small scale modifications are routinely incorporated and removed during a protein's lifespan and have a large influence on the regulation of protein activity either causing an increase or a decrease in activity. Larger scale modifications such as glycosylation and lipidation are usually more permanent alterations of the protein structure that are required for the protein to retain the active conformation. Sometimes small proteins or peptides can be added onto proteins to change their function or even target them for degradation. Two of the most common types of small peptides that serve this function are the ubiquitin protein and the sumo protein. Note that the ubiquitin protein contains a lot of lysine residues and is a fairly basic peptide. Attaching a single ubiquitin peptide onto a histone protein can cause it to release the DNA, similar to the process of acetylation. Thus, this method can be used to increase gene transcription as well. However, when proteins have many ubiquitins attached and become polyubiquinated, this is typically a signal that the protein will be degraded. We will focus on this process in greater detail in section 8.5. The sumopeptide is attached to proteins via lysine residues and appears to play a role in nuclear functions. It also may play a role in neuronal processes as well. Now let's focus on glycosylation. The incorporation of sugar residues onto a protein core is called glycosylation. Glycosylation occurs most commonly as an N-linked or an O-linked addition to the protein structure. Sometimes it can be also directly linked to a carbon atom. Asparagine usually serves as the sugar acceptor for the N-linked glycosylation, whereas a serine or a threonine typically serve as the acceptor for O-link glycosylations. C-link glycosylation occurs most often on tryptophan residues. Sugar addition can be fairly small, only containing one or a few sugar residues, or it can be quite extensive, forming highly branched sugar appendages. More than half of mammalian proteins are believed to be glycosylated. The conglomerate of sugar moieties that are linked to proteins is often referred to as the glycome. Inappropriate glycosylation or a lack of glycosylation can lead to genetic disorders and contribute to disease states such as cancer. Interestingly, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID infects cells through a surface protein known as the spike protein. 
Antibody therapies and vaccine strategies have centered on the development of immunity towards the spike protein. This hasn't been a simple matter, as the spike protein is highly glycosylated. Here is a recent cryo-electron micrograph of the spike protein that demonstrates that approximately 40% of the surface of the protein is covered with sugar modifications, which are shown in purple, gold, and rust colors, as well as green. Furthermore, the nature of the sugar appendages will vary according to the individual that is infected with the virus. Fortunately, 60% of the protein is still accessible, and there are a number of very highly accessible regions which are shown in red. The spiky bit up here that's circled in blue, or shown in this top-down view here, is the main epitope that binds with the ACE2 receptor and mediates infection. Fortunately, this is the same region that is also highly antigenic. Antibodies isolated from recently infected individuals show that people do generate an antibody response to SARS-CoV-2, as well as the other two related viruses, the first SARS virus and the MERS virus, which both have highly similar spike protein structures. This suggests that people can develop adaptive immunity to the virus and that the antibodies interfere with the virus's ability to infect the host. However, the high amount of glycosylation does make this more difficult as antigen-presenting cells within the immune system have a harder time presenting peptide fragments that are highly glycosylated. Thus, adaptive immunity may take longer to develop. Fortunately, the virus cannot shield this spiky epitope and hope to remain highly infective because this region of the protein is required for entry into the host cells. Thus, developing a vaccine to this epitope is a good strategy. So hopefully in the coming months, we will see a vaccine that is actually effective treatment against the SARS-CoV-2 virus and potentially against its neighboring viruses as well. Here is a closer look at an N-linked residue. Compared with the spike protein in the last slide, this is super simplistic and shows only a single sugar residue attached to the protein. We will explore more of the functions of glycosylated proteins in cell-cell recognition and communication as well as in joint cushioning and extracellular matrix networks next term. Proteins can also be modified with lipid structures through the process of lipidation. In general, lipid structures are often added to proteins that will end up being docked onto or into a lipid bilayer membrane. They can be linked by a wide array of different amino acids, including cysteine, lysine, and other residues that contain hydroxyl functional groups such as serine and threonine. We will cover lipidation in more detail next term and won't spend a lot of time on it here. In the next section, we will learn more about the allosteric regulation of enzymes.